What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 238 at block height 649,225 on Sunday, September 20th. What is up? Well, um, I have had an interesting phenomenon where I have been doing so much work that my stomach has decided, food, what's that? And so I'm basically... If I'm, you know, actually paying attention, I'm only eating once a day because I literally don't feel hungry at all because apparently my brain is getting fed with too much information that it's counting as food. See, this is when a normal person would just drink coffee all day. No, that would be a terrible idea. You should not be drinking coffee on an empty stomach. I do it every day. That's how I start the day. Yes, and that's why you start the day in the afternoon. <laughs> Lies! Slanders, woman's. I was awake at 8 in the morning today. Get out of I... here with that afternoon <laughs> shit. I've, I've been awake before 8 every day this week. It's actually the last two weeks. Shut up. With no coffee or alarm sometimes. <laughs> coffee is life. Ah, boy. So, somebody in Wall Street did a thing. They did a thing again. Do we know what thing they did? Did they stick it in their nose or some other uh, place on their body that's not supposed to go? Well, that would be very rude. Nobody offered to share with me. But, <laughs> yeah. So, um... Yeah, uh, Mr. Saylor, the CEO of MicroStrategy, has been making the uh, podcast rounds after uh, filing with the SEC on September 11th that uh, MicroStrategy intended to further adjust their Treasury Reserve policy um, to continue moving fiat into Bitcoin and explicitly declare it as their chief reserve asset. And then shortly after that, they came out with the fact that uh, they had bought another 125 million, I think, in Bitcoin to add to the corporate reserves. And um, yeah, so uh, a little more details have been coming out in the interview in terms of how they actually did this, um, the attitude in the company, and really, um, I'm starting to kind of think that this is, this really is going to be a big shift in things and not just a meme uh, where one company does something and that's the last we hear of it. Um, so first off, um, a lot of the board members for MicroStrategy had been personally invested in Bitcoin for quite a while at the point that the company actually did so. And interestingly, um, Sailor actually had people at the company um, just manually buying on order book exchanges um, in very tiny chunks and periodically withdraw, which actually kind of shocked me because I would have assumed a company like this would be going through OTC desks um, to make a purchase for uh, a block this big. And really, that kind of has me wondering... One, what's really going on lately in terms of OTC liquidity? And two, um, you know, what's really going on in terms of the makeup of, you know, traders on actual order book exchanges like Coinbase or Kraken and such? 
and really how much of the the customer makeup in terms of actual market activity at those businesses is companies or entities like this rather than just individual retail traders. So that's just an interesting thing to think about. And really at the end of the day, um, if this does steamroll to the position of this kind of being normalized in terms of CFOs at companies like this pushing for Bitcoin on the balance sheet, um, this actually becoming a domino among publicly traded companies like this, um, this is really going to have some macroeconomic consequences on the market. I mean, if you, if you really sit and think here, I believe... Um, you know, it would really only take getting up to like close to a hundred thousand uh, dollars to put billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin in micro strategy hands. Um, and depending on the scale of company and the the type of business they're involved in, you know, why wouldn't a company want to take some of their capital, put it into Bitcoin? And then just hold on to that while the valuation rises and draw off that rather than engage in new equity rounds. So if a company can actually get a sizable position in Bitcoin um, without much slippage and actually have that available on the market, like this could really start screwing with the dynamics of investment. You know, at the, at the private stage, why go to a VC firm or VC firms for multiple rounds of investment before going public when you could take a seed, put that into Bitcoin, and then not have to dilute your equity, you know, as the Bitcoin market goes up. And, you know, it's, I'm just really thinking, like, how does that actually play out to what degree? Because if, if this really does become normalized as a, a corporate um, you know, balance sheet strategy, I really don't see how that dynamic doesn't happen. And that, that's going to be kind of interesting for the investor class that kind of just circles around in, in the private stage, you know, funding capital into these types of businesses. You know, they're not going to be as needed because you just need a little a little pump at first to get your hands on a, a Bitcoin stash and then, you know, short the market imploding on itself over time. That's going to be a return without diluting equity. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of really interested to see whether uh, this fizzles out or more likely, in my opinion, this really does start becoming a norm for major companies. Have they actually talked about how they bought all this Bitcoin? Do they say? Yeah, they, they actually had employees individually on exchanges um, just buying little chunks, um, averaging in. <laughs> Wait, what, what do you mean by little chunks? How do you get $175 million worth of Bitcoin with your employees buying little chunks? That sounds I mean, so inefficient. They literally just had small chunk orders constantly being put in in exchanges to not uh, push the order book too far one way or another and just kept doing that. <laughs> so what you're saying is that MicroStrategy acquired their Bitcoin through microtransactions, so a MicroStrategy. <laughs> yeah. Also relevant. I totally think that that kind of thing generated as are. I mean, it's just, it, you know, it just really goes to show, I, I don't like talking price really on the show. I know you don't much either, Janine, but it, it really just makes you think you look at, you know, all of the, the down pressure for the past couple months and how we've always kind of just whooshed up and never really taken the, the kind of extreme tumbles that we do. And you got to think during that whole time period, um, <laughs> micro strategy was literally nipping at all the orders they could get their hands on. 
Again, I can't wait to... S I mean, it wouldn't be included in the leak that's coming up today, but it would be so funny to see if any of that generated czars, because if you're just having your employees like buy small amounts of Bitcoin repeatedly over a period of months, that's going to get someone interested. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'd I'd have to like actually sit down and listen to the entire interview uh, with Pomp. I just kind of looked at some highlights and then actually just dug around for like the SEC filing and stuff. But you know, I, I imagine there's got to be some way you do that above board. It's just mostly to me the interesting part is the fact that a massive business like that was just chipping away at order books that people usually assume are just mostly retail traders. Yes. But yeah, um, <laughs> I'm just chuckling inside thinking if this dynamic takes hold and VCs are less needed, how ridiculously butthurt and uh, childish some of the VC people who love to... Uh, rationalize their tokens and shit coins in this space start getting anyway though are we ready to look at some absurd ridiculous uh fatf guidances big fat f yeah so the FATF has published a new document um, looking at specific red flag indicators of money laundering and uh, terrorist financing that were based on a few hundred um, specific incident case studies that they put together over a while. And yeah, uh, <laughs> pretty much you breathe. Red flag, you blink, red flag, you gulp, red flag, you move an inch, red flag, you simply exist, yes, red flag. The the degree to which they have described things as red flags in here is utterly fucking insane. So um structuring VA transactions in small amounts. Um or under record keeping or reporting thresholds. So, you know, okay. like uh, cash. Um, so like stacking sats. So like all the people out there who constantly, you know, buy regularly tiny amounts of stuff and then withdraw. Hey, you know what? Let's wait and see if that becomes structuring, at least as an accusation. I guess we'll find out. Um, making multiple high value transactions in short succession such as within a 24 hour period hmm so like an arbitrage trader who maybe notices a difference between two exchanges price levels and so moves a bunch of money back and forth to trade in arbitrage to make profit yeah um let's see Transferring virtual assets immediately to uh, multiple other um, virtual asset service providers. Um, so um, that could potentially be, I don't know. You know, I don't like trading shit coins. I think it's stupid, but there is a lot of fragmentation in this market. You know, like um, this coin is only listed here, but not there. And I don't know, maybe there's a lot of good reasons to want to transfer an asset to some other place where a market exists that was not in existence in that prior business. Hmm. Um, depositing virtual assets at an exchange and um, converting the virtual asset to multiple types of virtual assets without a logical business explanation, um, such as portfolio diversification. Well, here's the thing here. If I, if I send, you know, one asset to an exchange and buy a bunch of other, um, who the fuck are you to know, um, what I'm doing, whether that's portfolio diversification, um, seems like that is really going to cause a bunch of problems. Um, accepting funds suspected as stolen or fraudulent, obviously, duh, that's going to be on the list. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, conducting a large initial deposit um, when you open a uh, uh, an account with a new VASP. Hmm. 
um, while the amount is inconsistent with the customer profile. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. So in other words, if you are one of the thousands upon thousands of people in this space who maybe um, did not have a lot of wealth to their name prior to getting involved in this space, but has acquired some, um, hey, guess what? You're getting a fucking finger shoved up your ass. Uh, hmm. Let's see. Ooh, a new user attempts to uh, trade their entire balance or tries to send their entire balance off platform. What? What's that? There's an entirely new financial asset class that allows you to self-custody your money. Whoopsies. Looks like taking all of your money off that platform. Big red flag. Red flag. Going to have to crawl up your ass there. Hmm. Let's see. Um. Oh, if you, it just using um, multiple virtual assets, red flag. Um, incoming transactions um, from unrelated wallets um, in small amounts. So I'm going to assume by wallet, they mean address. Um, oh, so anybody who's running a business or doing anything accepting payments that's not doing dumb shit like reusing the same address over again. Red flag, finger up the ass. Hmm. Converting large amounts of fiat into virtual assets um, hmm, with no logical business explanation. What's a logical business explanation? Is me deciding that that's the safest place to put my money because the entire fucking economy is imploding? Not a good business reason? Hmm, guess we'll find out. Finger up the ass. Let's see. Red flags related to anonymity. This is fun. So, um, more than one type of virtual asset in a transaction, um, despite additional transaction fees. Um, so, hey, if you move into another asset to do something, um, you know, that's an extra fee. So you're going to have to explain why you wanted to pay the extra fee because that's a red flag finger up the ass. Hmm. Just shifting from a transparent blockchain to an asset that isn't transparent finger up the ass. Um, anybody who is uh, operating as an unregistered or unlicensed VASP on a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Um, so in other words, um, anybody who who is trading on those exchanges, because if I remember right, um, you actually have to be, you know, as an active business doing that, um, it's completely legal for you to dispose of personal investments wherever the fuck you want. But you know what? You do it that way, finger up the ass. Hmm. Let's see. Abnormal transactional activity of virtual assets cashed out at exchanges from P2P associates. So, hey, guess what? You bought no KYC Bitcoins. Hey, hey, they didn't come from Coinbase. Red flag. Finger up the ass. Um, any transactions associated with um, mixing or tumbling services or peer-to-peer -peer platforms. Red flag finger up the ass transactions making use of mixing or tumbling services finger up the ass hmm anything that goes to any kind of questionable source like a known darknet market um mixing gambling um ransomware things like that this one was obvious finger up the ass hmm the use of decentralized unhosted hardware or paper wallets to transport virtual assets across borders so what, when I want to take a, you know, a couple grand of my money on vacation somewhere, oh, guess what? Yep, the TSA is going to stick a finger up my ass. Um, oh, and apparently, um, IP Actual addresses. Fingers. Yeah, that one. <laughs> IP addresses associated with a, uh, a dark net or similar software. That it, so VPNs. VPNs, you want to protect your privacy. Hey, maybe you're checking your Coinbase balance at the coffee shop and you use a VPN so that, you know, there's an extra layer protecting you from things like phishing attacks, finger up the ass. Also, it looks like there's a whole class of virtual assets that are just Ponzi schemes um, or not documented enough. Touch any of those finger up the ass. Oh, so is using ATMs, um, Bitcoin ATMs. If you regularly use those, if you do more than just a one-off purchase from an ATM, yep, red flag, finger up the ass. So um, yeah, 
if you really want to keep digging through this, um, there's a few other classes of these things. Oh no, here, here's one. Okay, w one one more in the long list be before it, it's just go go read it yourself. Um, I'm running out of fingers. If a customer's age is over the average age of that customer's platform, red flag. Sorry, there is no way that a boomer would actually invest in something like Bitcoin with the entire economy imploding and you know their pensions or social security or other such things at massive risk. No, 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 no. They're being scammed. Red flag, finger up the ass. Ageism, ageism fingers. So yeah. Um, even interpreting this in the most charitable way possible, it's literally any reason they want, they're going to stick a finger up your ass because it's a red flag. Everything's a red flag. Woo! So, yeah, I have a suggestion for the FATF. The next time they want to write a report like this, they should just tell us what kind of transaction is not a red flag and then everyone can do it. And that will consist of like one paragraph, maybe. And then they don't have to write multiple pages just, you know, to save digital paper. Yeah, it's just like this is just so fucking absurd. Like this is like literally any type of fucking activity that happens in this space for completely justifiable, normal, reasonable reasons um, is now a red flag. Oh, yeah. The, the, I, I, last bit. I got it. Um, so um, indicators for sources of, of wealth or funds. Um, anything coming from a uh, mixer or tumbler service. Um, Anybody whose um, wealth is derived mostly from investments in virtual assets and shit. Wow. So, hey, hey, guys, you came into this space, you know, you, you turned your life around, you made money. That's a red flag. Finger up the ass. Like, e even if, if you have multiple bank accounts, hey, that's a red flag. Financial system access, red flag. Mm -hmm. so, Using money, red flag. Yeah. I mean, if, if this if this is the, the guidance that's coming out, the, the, this is what we're going to be dealing with over the next few years. Um, it's, it's just going to be period. Um, you use any of these services, um, you're going to get a finger up your ass. And you're going to have to explain any arbitrary detail about anything that they ask for. Or they're just going to leave it up your ass and potentially take your money too. Yep, that's uh, basically a list of a million reasons to take your money. Mm-hmm. Like, I use custodial services. I can't get around it being all in Bitcoin, but you know what? I sure as shit never leave a damn thing on them that I'm not spending in the next day or two. Like, that is the attitude anybody touching services like that should have, period. Because this is the landscape change that's coming. All right. Well, that was a lot of red flags and fingers up the ass. Well, it's government. <laughs> yes, it is. Hence, I am a no-fingers-up-the-ass anarchist. It's more comfortable, at least. Or even better, whistleblow on the government and put your fingers up their ass. Yep. Here's a way you can do that. So, um, this is actually really interesting, um, dynamic change as far as mixing tools in Bitcoin go. But, uh... What's the name of the app? Uh, Chain Case, um, a project developing a iOS uh, Wasabi fork, has set up their own um, fork of ZK Snacks uh, Zero Link Coordinator. And they have tweaked things um, to a different round structure. So 
they're just running a, a coordinator that is doing, um, I think, six uh, participant rounds of 0 0.01. Um, so th this is offering an option um, for Wasabi users um, who, who don't necessarily have or want to deal with mixing uh, larger amounts such as 0 0.1, 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.4, so on. And yeah, um, there is actually a link in the show notes for any Wasabi users out there. Um, you can actually hook Wasabi Wallet itself up to the, the chain case coordinator with some... Uh, config file changes. Um, there's a paste bin in the show notes um, in one of Nopara's tweets uh, walking users through how to do that. But I just think this is pretty fucking cool uh, on two fronts. Um, one, um, Wasabi users um, now have an option for those smaller amount mixes, uh, which was kind of a main distinguisher between them and Samurai. And also it's just the fact that there are now multiple separate entities um, running a coordinator that's compatible with a single client. So that's something I've been waiting for for a while now, and it's good to see that happen. I'm kind of curious, you know, how the profitability of that works out for them um, compared to how it has for Wasabi. And, you know, if that goes well, maybe we might see even more coordinators start popping up. Ooh. Pew, pew, pew. So what's this I hear about people trying to bribe um, people on the internet with Bitcoin to do stuff? Yeah, um, of all the things that could be added to the list of red flags, I think paying people to run anonymity software is going to be added soon. But um, anyway, you may recall that in April this year, we did a special edition with Harry Halpin about NIM Technologies, where he is the CEO and chairman of the scientific board, in addition to at least seven other team members. And we didn't cover the Lightning Conference in Berlin last October, but one of the talks was by Claudia Diaz, their chief scientist, and she gave a talk about Lightning Network, privacy threats towards, net towards network adversaries, about how NIM can be used with Bitcoin, and some of the privacy deficiencies in the Lightning Network, which we've talked about on this show since a number of times. So if you want to hear in general more about Mixnets, I would recommend checking out either of those videos under this story in the description. But essentially, the goal of a Mixnet is to improve upon the anonymity properties offered by Tor by also being better about handling metadata. And on September 10th, uh, 10 days ago, Dave, their CTO, wrote that they were very pleased to announce the availability of version 0 0.8.0 .0 of the NIM platform. Uh, and he describes it as the biggest release ever. And part of the release is their SOX 5 client. And as he describes, the client can be run on a local machine, ergo your laptop. When you start the client, you specify which Sphinx SOX service provider you would like to handle requests for you. All your traffic will go through the mixnet and Sphinx SOX will make network requests on your behalf. Responses are piped back to the originating application and reassembled after going through the mixnet on a return journey. The proxy and service provider work together transparently. The application itself doesn't even notice a mixnet was involved. Um, and he says, since we make it practical for sysadmins to run Sphinx Socks without undue stress, it ships with a default list of allowed requests that it can make. We have cataloged the requests made by Blockstream Green and Electrum wallets and put them in the default allowed list for Sphinx Socks. This gets around the ugly problem of running over proxies. Uh, one minute while I, or second while I scroll. Um, th and then according to a recent Coindesk article about the release, um, they say NIM has largely been focusing on its testnet with node operators hosting them as a labor of love. Now NIM will c uh, compensate operators using Bitcoin. One of the ways it offers rewards is through LBTC on the liquid sidechain using the Blockstream Green Wallet. So that's more detail about that. Uh, Liquid offers on-chain privacy using confidential transactions, which obscure the amounts being paid for those who uh, don't have or uh, want a wait for those who don't have or want a Blockstream. And that's a very for those who don't want 
who who don't have or want a blockstream green wallet, NIM will reward operators with Bitcoin because NIM doesn't want to force anyone to adopt a particular wallet. It will also be launching an incentivized bounty program to test the network's strength. Um, and then it says NIM will be launching its own reputation system, NIMF, which lets uh, it and node operators keep track of which mix nodes are online and mixing data packets uh, even across multiple chains. And so on the uh, stuff with Bitcoin and the reputation system, the blog post about the release that they had published also talks about the incentive system they're working on. Um, it says, and this is again from Dave, the CTO, I think, um, we have issued a token that is without value like all testnet tokens to allow us to stress test the next phase of the development of NIM. We have already rewarded some of our testnet nodes in BTC. Many of them have been with us since our testnet launched at the Chaos Computer Congress in 2019, and we'll be doing rewards and bug bounties at regular intervals to be paid in BTC, so run up a mixed node using NIM version 0.8.0, and as a final note, he encourages you, if you want to test this out, to sign up at nimtech.net slash incentives to get started. Woo-woo! Yeah, I am actually really excited to see this kind of moving forward. And just the fact, I don't know, because it's like we're, when we had uh, Harry uh, from Nimon, you know, he was kind of talking about their unsurety as far as how to go funding things and whether or not, you know, trying to bake Bitcoin into things made more sense versus like their their own token to try to handle that type of stuff and i'm just glad to see at least in 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 this phase like they're they're paying out bitcoin for people to just test the general architecture and you know i i will be very upset if some token winds up coming out of this but i have to give them props at least for getting to that last and not building the entire thing, just taking that for granted. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But yeah, it would definitely be nice to have something like this that's uh, protected against the kind of timing aspects that things like Tor don't. Alrighty. Are we, are we ready to see if Shinobi can be nice? Uh, we can always give it a try. <laughs> so, um, for anybody out there who is still using a Trezor, um, stop and buy something else. Um, there is a new firmware update for the, the Model T and the One. Um, and specifically, um, for anybody using passwords, update this. Um, I had never even thought about this before, um, but in the case of users entering passphrases um, on their computer rather than the device itself, um, you could have malware swap that out and enter a different password and create a kind of hostage situation that using an absurdly large chain um, derivation index could do in the fact that the user thinks they entered their passphrase but a fake one goes in and they send money there and now you demand your uh your money before you tell them what the passphrase is so this will now prompt on the uh, model t um it will show the passphrase you've entered on the or through the computer on the device to verify before it activates it um, really though, what they should be doing, because that device has the ability to enter it, um, through the actual Trezor device is just don't allow users to enter it through a computer. If the device can take the passphrase input on the device, that should be the only option. That said, um, they've also introduced a hard limit on transaction fees. Um, so they used to have a, a soft limit where a warning would be um, shown to the user at a fee of 0 0.005 BTC. And they've instituted a hard limit at 
zero five. Now, honestly, this is probably not going to happen too much, if at all, more of a fringe thing. But the only way to turn that um, hard limit off is through their command line tool. And I can see quite a few um, possible reasons why some users might have a large number of outputs um, that in certain fee conditions, um, you know, might actually have fees that high. And, you know, this is a uh, like this should have a way to turn this off in the web interface or simply without resulting to the command line because I can just imagine right now the few fringe users who get caught in that situation and how obnoxious and frustrating dealing with that will wind up being. So yeah, if you, you have a treasure, you use passphrases, update to this, and if you enter your passphrase um, through a keyboard instead of on the treasure, stop fucking doing that. Stop. All right. So here's here's where I'm gonna I'm gonna fail being nice. I think with this next one, I, I don't think I can do it. Alrighty. So Ledger has finally instituted um, coin control in the ledger live app so that now in an advanced tab you can manually select which inputs go into your transactions when you spend um you know it only took three years um after i suggested this and got into a giant argument with btc chip on twitter um where he pretty much um stated outright that users were too stupid to understand how to check things in a list or grasp what a utxo was when explained to them so there's no way that's happening um but it finally has wow kind of funny how you know if you you put something in the, in the app, it's just a list to click on, people will figure it out. But um, yeah, I, I don't remember if I, I knew this back before I threw my treasure or ledger in the garbage, but apparently the default coin selection for Ledger Live is just FIFO. It's just first in, first out. And holy shit. Um, is that absolutely retarded, both in terms of cost and privacy? Um, in terms of cost, um, FIFO like that, hey, you have some dust outputs in there in your wallet. Well, if they're closer to the first in, they're just gonna get spent and you're gonna pay a massive fee. And the wallet's just gonna do that because first in, first out, I wonder how many ledger users have paid ridiculous amounts in fees um, for that because ledger are incompetent, lazy fuckwits who can't take advantage of the massive amount of actual academic work on coin selection that's already been done for them by other people in this space, but probably cost their users a decent amount of money. And then also the privacy concerns um, for users who transact a lot. Um, you know, regularly buying things. Um, well, what's probably going to happen unless you're constantly adding new UTXOs um, is it's just going to cycle through your list and then it's going to wrap around and it's going to cycle through it again, shaving down the UTXO values you have until eventually all of these UTXOs start getting linked together on chain because once you've shaved them down where they're too small to buy things with, you're just going to start combining them because FIFO. So um, rather than praise Ledger for finally adding such a basic feature for users to manage their own privacy and, and costs in transacting, um, holy shit, these people are so fucking incompetent and do not give a flying fuck about how their product um, costs users money to use it in default settings and they don't give a flying fuck about the consequences of their users privacy and that's not just privacy to ledger using their back end that's privacy that actually compounds on chain and is is visibly lost for observing third parties so just fucking golf clap ledger you guys are fucking clowns 
Yeah, I mean, to be fair, when I um, when I asked Trezor the same thing, I got a similar answer, which is this is too advanced. To use Electrum, and it's like, yeah, I I can I can use Electrum, but um, also it's not that hard to do this to offer it as a you know option in the interface, but whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm just more flabbergasted by the the default setting. Like, holy shit. Like, FIFO? That's it? Like, you you can't even do a simple thing to do, like, the the cheapest combination possible? Or, like, you know what I mean? Like, there's so much fucking research in this space that has been done on different coin selection algorithms. You're just going to do FIFO. Who gives a fuck if that's more expensive for your users? Who gives a fuck if that completely destroys their privacy over time because they transact a lot? Like, Jesus fucking Christ. Whew. All right. Move along, or can I keep yelling? I think we should move along. <laughs> All right. So... A while back, uh, Lightning Labs dropped their uh, Faraday, um, I don't know, terminal for managing Lightning nodes. And really quickly, um, they've dropped a new functionality for that. Um, I don't know how... Hmm. I'm just trying to predict how you're going to react to this, Janine. Um, so it's accounting software. Um, it pretty much exactly accounts in a CSV format every single um, transaction, positive or negative, um, for bookkeeping purposes for your node. Um, now, this is definitely um, very useful for people who are just trying to monitor the the profitability of their node and all of that. But, you know, the real killer app that most people aren't going to want to acknowledge here is this is for tracking how much money you made so you can pay taxes and run a legal business and stuff because you know if you don't do that properly you get in big shit and this kind of technically is a thing that makes you income yeah i mean i i uh this isn't because this isn't the same thing that the irs has been mentioning in their statement about lightning labs producing software that they're interested in for whatever freaking surveillance tool they're trying to build no nah, i highly doubt um th- this is just all local um local databases for the actual node operator to use um the irs would have to um hack source your computer to really turn this against you in some way if you uh aren't voluntarily complying with your tax obligations but i mean it's just uh sucks but uh yeah, it is what it is. And frankly, the reality is that in a lot of jurisdictions, people running lightning nodes, um, they're technically making income they need to pay taxes on and account for. And um, ultimately, whether you do that or not is on you, dude. But if you choose to uh, bend over for that, um, here's something that will at least logistically make it way less of a nightmare. Fingers up the ass, but less of a nightmare, TM. Smaller fingers. It, it doesn't stretch as much. You know, because you breathe and you open. It's not as tense. I don't, Shinobi, don't do... No, <laughs> we, don't need, we, don't, we don't need more detail. Alrighty then. Guess next up, and I do believe last lightning update, is a uh, new drop for... Uh, C Lightning 0.9.1, and I actually forget what the silly release name is for this. But um, there's actually a decent amount of under the hood speed ups. Um, so while they were working on this release, uh, they realized that kind of bootstrapping um, or, or reactivating nodes with downtimes uh, was really taking a lot of time um and so they went down and refactored um all of the code related to the uh reading the the json structures involved in looking at these databases and pretty much um brought looking at payment histories in a node with fifty thousand payments um down from a 50 second operation to 1.5 seconds 
and also did the same thing as far as um, block parsing. Um, they found that after a week of downtime, that's about 2,000 blocks, it would take around 16 minutes for a sea lightning to parse that and catch back up. And so after these optimizations, um, they have dropped that down to six minutes. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, down from 5.4 seconds per block to 2.1. So just nerdy um, stuff under the hood, wildly optimized. And as far as uh, the multi-part uh, payment support from the last version, um, they pretty much were kind of too aggressive in terms of attempting to split payments by default. Um, so they toned that down a little bit um, in terms of just uh, bringing the error rate for uh, multi-path payment attempts down a little bit. And also, um, change their invoice logic um, so that it can handle um, multiple um, channel hints for a route. So rather than just kind of directing whoever's paying you to a single one of your channels um, to receive through, they'll include multiple for uh, better multi-path uh, payment support. And then another really cool thing, um, they've pretty much created this new plugin multi fun channel and refactored um, their fun channel functions to use this. And um, pretty much this allows you to cram opening and closing um, channel operations into a single transaction. And on testnet, um, they were able to open 106 channels in a single transaction. So that's definitely a huge optimization just in terms of efficiency moving in and out of channels. So, uh, yeah, give a, a little golf clap for all the folks at uh, Blockstream for this one and uh, off to the races. So I do believe uh, there is still some new software that's came out to talk to bots. Yep. Um, on September 11th, the day that shall not be named, uh, there was a new release of Electrum 4.0.3, and they didn't make too big a deal of it. Um, they just actually labeled it as fixing minor bugs, um, but actually it included a new recovery tool that was built by Luke Childs, and the release notes say, new feature, automated BIP39 recovery from pull requests 6219 and 6155. When restoring a BIP39 seed, add option to scan many known derivation paths for history and show them to user to choose from. And if you don't already know, in episode 188, uh, August last year, that was, I think, when I first talked about some of the guides that Rodolfo and I had started working on independently, which uh, we then merged into walletsrecovery.org. Um, and it's basically a guide that helps people to find documentation about apps for wallets and the various features that support, which may impact whether you are able to um, practically recover your private keys or import them to other wallets interoperably. And this year in June, Luke Childs made a pull request to introduce a recovery tool for Electrum, which would allow you to input a BIP39 seed and have those keys scanned for used derivation paths, as I said. And he, he uh, when he was creating the tool, he actually used data collected by our wallets recovery guide to implement it. And so this would be helpful for someone who maybe has an old backup that they haven't touched in a while and aren't sure which wallet it was generated from or someone who has tried to import those keys into another wallet and been shown a zero balance um, probably freaking them the fuck out when in fact a lot of the time the wallet just simply can't find where your bitcoin are because it doesn't support those particular derivation paths for example if you try to import your uh your segwit coins uh, into or coins on SegWit addresses into a wallet that doesn't support SegWit, you may not um, see them not supporting those derivation paths. And so, wallet uh, wallets recovery explains what you know these things are like derivation paths and how important they are, despite not really being emphasized too much in terms of educating users about um, how 
their wallet works and if you aren't familiar with them you can check them out there's an explainer at the bottom and yeah this tool is now available with the latest i think it's still the latest release of electrum so you can go and try it out if you have either of those problems Woo woo! honestly like I almost want to say that this should just be a default thing in the wallet that just scans all of these derivation paths in a single wallet, but eh, now that I'm thinking about it, that would probably be a bad default for privacy concerns. Like if, if you go in and try to recover like a postmix samurai or wasabi path, then you pretty much are doxing all of those UTXOs to that Electrum server. Yeah, and in fact, um that that's the reason why the there's a limit for how many you can like how much history you can go through when you're using the tool. Um like you wouldn't you wouldn't really want to use this for keys that you have, for example, on BTC Pay Server because that's a merchant tool. So obviously, you're going through a lot of addresses, and that they 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 were worried about like the effect that would have on other Electrum services that you're querying that data from. So yes, I don't think there was some discussion about whether that limit should. Like, if you should have the option to change it, I think they decided not to do that. I'm not sure. Um, obviously, you can go in and change it manually yourself if you know how to do that. Actually, something I just um, thought, is this like uh, like you actually have to import the seed into Electrum itself? Or can you use this functionality with like a master public key too? Um, I don't you basically you give it i don't think it gives you the option to do a master public key i think it's just the seed um i don't think you have to actually import it into the wallet i think it gives you that option um but no i don't think it forces you to import it into electrum it just it just scans the the addresses for that key woo woo no it is uh it is not wallet recovery services or wallet recovery.info it's wallets recovery.org <laughs> all righty so yeah this uh this next one um i'm actually super happy to see this because i'm not gonna lie i was kind of pissed uh when i first saw the initial grant announcement here uh why? Because RGB died? <laughs> no, but I actually did think that's what that meant at first. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, a while back, uh, Square Crypto gave a grant to the Bitcoin development kit, um, a library project for Bitcoin wallets. And, um, you know, no nothing against uh, Mr. Myers involved with that or, or the project, but... I was just kind of extremely flabbergasted that Square threw a grant um, to start a whole new project when Alico Sfalini, uh from Italy had already been working on and you know made a, a decent start at his magical Bitcoin library uh, for the exact same purposes. So I am really happy that both of those projects have effectively merged their efforts into one. And, uh, you know, one, I'm just happy about that because obviously, you know, more heads uh, on the same thing is going to be more productive. But it, it was just it, it really bothered me that Square with these grants just threw money at something brand new from scratch rather than spending the time to see if something was already in motion in this space along those lines. So I'm glad to see that kind of got reconciled and, you know, hopefully in future, if they want to throw grants at something, you know, maybe spend a little time seeing what's already in motion rather than just throw fresh money at people to start from scratch. Is it autism time? 
It, it is because I'm looking at whether the FinCEN files have uh, launched yet. I think it's in one minute. Oops, got to buzz through then. So Jeremy Rubin proposed a replacement for uh, child pays for parents and RBF uh, to speed up the confirmation of low fee transactions. And pretty much the gist is here, um, you know, basically creates a transaction um, with a special output that takes a transaction ID as an argument. Um, and you, you could do other things or maybe try to play some taproot games or commit to that in a different way. But the, the idea is something in this new transaction has to buy transaction ID point at another transaction without using an input or actually spending it. And pretty much he wants to modify the mempool um, to allow a single transaction like this to refer to a single um, other transaction and kind of alter the mempool logic to treat um, those transaction as like a, an ancestor chain with dependency between them, even though strictly speaking, there isn't and use this new transaction with a pointer um, to kind of go, hey, miner, here's a higher fee, um, speed up confirming this other thing. And um, let's just say I think it's an interesting idea, especially in the sense that it's, it's flexible that uh, any transaction could speed up any other transaction like this. Um, so you could even have third parties doing this. But one, um, I wonder about the privacy issues, um, that could possibly come along with that, um, explicitly pointing out connections between otherwise unrelated transactions. And also, um, I kind of wonder about the incentives here because with RBF, the reason that that works is it's the same inputs with a higher fee, which a miner is going to want to prefer and only one of them can confirm. So the natural outcome is the miner confirms the higher fee one, they have to make a binary choice. With child pays for parents, um, you know, you have the second transaction that can't confirm without the ancestor transaction that it's trying to speed up confirming also, because without that, the inputs from the second one are not valid inputs to spend. And so there's kind of a guarantee here with both of them. And now in the privacy sense, um, using RBF, the way that it changes um, change outputs, um, you kind of are losing privacy. So there's not much difference between RBF and um, Ruben's new proposal. But in the case of child pays for parent, um, a payment output or a change output can both use child pays for parent. So this in my mind would have worse privacy than, than child pays for parent at least. And the, the main issue I really see with this is, you know, in the case of RBF or child pays for parents, a minor have to confirm a singular thing. Whereas with this, um, what's to stop a minor from just confirming your pointer transaction that has a higher fee and just don't confirm the one that you want sped up. Um, so I don't really see how this could really have the same kind of guarantees that RBF or child pays for parent would, but I, I, I could still see some cases in which this would actually be useful or have some utility. Why do you never want to get autistic, Janine? My autism is at over 9,000. <laughs> Alrighty, so next up, I guess, uh... Vincent files dropped. Ooh, now I really gotta speed up. Alright, so, uh, Blockstream Research, um, while working on some of their Miniscript stuff, uh, kind of found a, a conflict issue, um, with potential Bitcoin scripts. And, um... I find this really kind of interesting because I had 
literally never considered this um, ever before. But some developers, um, such as AJ Towns, um, had just thought that this was dead obvious and was kind of confused when this was published that this even needed to be explained. But there is in both CSV and CLTV, the uh, two time lock operations, there's two ways you can use them. Um, you can count either in Unix timestamps um, with time, or you can count in block height. So everything below, I think, 500 million in the value is a block, and everything above that is a Unix timestamp. And the problem comes in when you try to use both of those in the same script. Um, so let's say hypothetically I have this uh, three of three multisig, and one of those keys has a CSV time lock in um, seconds, and the other one has one in blocks um, in a single UTXO. That could never be spent um, on chain. Because in order to spend something using CSV, you have to include in the end sequence field in a transaction input um, the, the value corresponding to the actual CSV lock. And if you have a script that is using CSV to work both in seconds and block heights, um, it's impossible to ever include an end sequence um, value in the spending input um, that would be valid for both of those conditions. So that script is literally impossible to ever spend. And the same thing exists with CLTV, except that's filling in the end lock time value of the whole transaction. So um, even if you had, say, a transaction that had um, two separate inputs one of which was using um, CLTV marked in seconds and the other in block height, um, those could never be in the same transaction because there is only one end lock time field in a single transaction. And so this is kind of a, a potential uh, foot gun here when you're using time locks in script. And the problem is mini script, um, the, which the, the biggest point for that existing is being able to analyze the correctness of a script, um, looks at things like this and considers them completely valid scripts, even though they would literally be impossible to spend on the blockchain. So it's just kind of one, an interesting um, just thing in terms of how Bitcoin script really interacts um, with different things at a really low level, but also a really important thing for any developers working with time locks for any reason to consider, um, because this kind of screw up could literally leave coins effectively burned forever and unspendable. All right, continue racing through Shinobi's chunk. So Mr. Jihan Wu, has uh, come out on top, at least in mainland China again. Um, as of September 14th, the business registration in mainland China um, shows Jihan Wu has once again become the legal uh, representative and director of Beijing Bitmain Technologies. Um, so it looks like pretty much from this point on, um, short any more private security um, company incidents that Jihan has regained control of all of Bitmain's operations in China. But the lawsuit in the Cayman Islands um, parent company for all of the Chinese subsidiaries is still going on. So I do not think that we will have a, uh, a resolution to this anytime soon. But yeah. Um, Jihan is pretty much just focused on pretty much repairing brand damage, um, salvaging what there is to work with in the company reputationally, and um, trying to move along. 
So let's see how long it takes them to smash this into the ground. When at first when you said brand damage, I thought you said brain damage, and I was like, oh, what? <laughs> Maybe I said both in a quantum superposition. All right, and then last update, I guess. Um, Kraken has officially won a uh, bank charter in the state of Wyoming, um, and they are now a special purpose depository institution. So yeah, um, Kraken is definitely going to be uh, rolling out and shilling this just as far as their exchange services operate. Uh, obviously, um, any banking problems that crop up with exchanges are not going to occur with the exchange that has their own bank. Um, but this is a 100% reserve special depository. Um, they are not allowed to fractionally reserve in any way uh, customer deposits of fiat currency at any time. Um, and one thing I do want to point out here because of that is um, they are not going to be getting FDIC insurance um, either because of the fact that they're going to be full reserve at all times. But um, yeah, it looks like pretty much. Um, they want to um, really shift into not just banking services for the exchange itself, but just general um, kind of hybrid uh, fiat services. Um, they also want to custody um, crypto assets as well as fiat under the uh, Depository Institute. Um, as well as work on mobile uh, banking applications and debit cards uh, linked up to people's crypto accounts so that they can use. And on the corporate side, um, things like uh, account management services, um, proof of funds, attestations, and verifications of deposits. Um, but yeah, um, they're going to be starting off trying to expand these services in the United States and intend to try to push that uh, more internationally as things allow. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Kraken is uh, shifting from just another one of those shitcoin casinos to, uh, I think, trying to play more in the realm of what Coinbase is doing um, and make themselves your little one-stop uh, service shop for everything in the space. Well, and I also, uh, on the day that it got announced, I saw a picture of their banking charter documents, and it was a very, 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 very thick binder, and I'm just like, oh, I do not want to ever be the kind of person who has to write a binder of paper that big. Yeah. Red tape is obnoxious. Alrighty, though. I do believe, uh, last two things are both interesting, uh... Whistleblower dump incidents, one after the other? Well, not dump, um, because we actually... Uh, I'll have to check with the second one, but, you know, both of these either involve redactions or what holding the source document, so it's not dump, but Boo. on September... <laughs> well... On September 14th, Bcrypt uh, tweeted that a friend of hers who worked at a... Uh, as a data scientist at Facebook, he, uh, Zhang, Zhang uh, had been fired from her job at Facebook and turned down a $64,000 severance package in order to leak this. Wow. So when I saw that number, like, because um, I'll kind of, it, the stuff I'm going to quote is going to mention this, but like they say that they have a human resource problem and it's like, if you're getting $64,000 in severance, um, you clearly don't have a money, like the, as in Facebook, Facebook does not have a money problem, like just literally pay people um, to do things and maybe you'll solve your human resource problem because that severance is more than I made in four years. Um, yeah, anyway, so this uh turn so she turned down 64,000 severance package in order to leak this this being a 60 uh, or 6600 word internal memo which she says details how the social network knew leaders of countries around the world were using their site to manipulate voters and failed to act um 
This appeared in a BuzzFeed article from the same day. Um, some select quotes. Uh, Zhang discovered inauthentic activity, a Facebook term for engagement from bot accounts and coordinated manual accounts in Bolivia and Ecuador, but chose not to prioritize it due to her workload, the amount of power she had as a mid-level employee to make decisions about a country's political outcomes took a toll on her health. With no oversight whatsoever, uh, she says, I was left in a situation where I was trusted with immense influence in my spare time, she wrote. A manager on strategic response mused to myself that most of the world outside the West was in, was effectively the Wild West, self as the part-time dictator. He meant the statement as a compliment, but it illustrated the immense pressures upon me. Uh, Zhang's memo said that the lack of institutional support and heavy stakes left her unable to sleep. She often and felt responsible when civil unrest took hold in places she didn't prioritize for investigation and action. I've made countless decisions in this vein, from Iraq to Indonesia to it to Italy to El Salvador. She wrote, individually, the impact was likely small in each case, but the world is a vast place. Uh, still, she did not believe that the failures she observed during her two and a half years at the company were the result of bad intent by Facebook's employees or leadership. I would disagree with that, but I have not worked at Facebook. Um just saying it was a lack of resources zhang roach and the company's tendency <laughs> lack of resources the tendency uh, of the company to focus on global activity that posed relations risks as opposed to electoral or civic harm one second while i scroll lack of resources and facebook in the same sentence lol also like even human like uh, like how, you run a social networking company and you say that you don't have human resources. Um, you know, Facebook, um, you could maybe just find them with with your social network. <laughs> you know, I don't I don't know. Just crazy idea, you know, f using a social network to find the right people to do a job that really needs to be done. Apparently is very hard. Um, anyway, the rest of the article from BuzzFeed deals with the instances of uh, inauthentic activity, i.e. suspected bot behavior uh, related to the United States, the UK, Italy, Honduras, Brazil, Azerbaijan, Bolivia, or El Salvador, Iraq, India, Indonesia, Ukraine, Turkey, Taiwan, the Philippines, and Australia, but there are probably more. And uh, the article concludes, uh, Zhang was fired this month and posted her memo on her last day, even after offering to stay through the election as an unpaid volunteer. Holy shit, Facebook, you are a pile of garbage. Um, in her goodbye, she encouraged her colleagues to remain at Facebook and to fix the company from within. Good luck with that. Uh, but you don't and shouldn't need to do it alone, she wrote. Find others who share your convictions and values to work on it together. Facebook is too big of a project for any one person to fix. End quote. One second while I take some medicine to the brain. Like, like seriously, how, how the hell, I just don't understand how you can, like, how Facebook does not have a resource problem, they don't have a human resource problem either, because they don't have a resource problem, and they run a social network where they can, you know, find people, like, or, or something, like, how, how is this, how, how is this happening? <laughs> well, um. Taking her personal assessment of things at face value, um, that there actually is a resource issue, if not um, what is there, um, how it's deployed, um, it really reinforces a lot of my suspicions about what is going on in these companies. Um, and really, I just think that they're so big and it's like... <clears throat> There just is not a way to really have things like moderation, how you handle situations like of geopolitical significance like this, and how they're dealt with, like any kind of homogeneity there. And so really what's going on is I just have always kind of assumed that these companies are just little pockets of anarchy where people are enforcing their own priorities or their own political attitudes just kind of lackadaisically. And there isn't really any kind of consistency there beyond a general slant. Um, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. 
And it's like, that just does not really seem sustainable to me or a way to run platforms that are ostensibly trying to be the public squares of the 21st century. Like that's, <laughs> I, I have a feeling that we're going to see a lot more, um, you know, whistleblowers or, or former employees or even current employees in, in these companies telling similar tales over the next few years. And hopefully that does not just turn into tribal uh, side versus side and an actual recognition of the, the real underlying issue there. Otherwise, uh, not going to be a fun rest of the decade. All right, so what's going on with, with, what's going on with this drop? What just happened? What's going on? Who's got egg on their face? Who looks stupid? Uh well, I am not sure yet because I ha literally it just dropped, so I haven't had a chance to figure that out. One second, not one second to figure out who has egg on their face. I can't work that quickly, but um, <laughs> so as some of you, uh, I mean, I saw Manafort's name a lot, so that's gonna be fun. Um, as some of you may have noticed, FinCEN, uh, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, published a note notice on September 1st that they were, quote, aware that various media outlets intend to publish a series of articles based on unlawfully disclosed suspicious activity reports, otherwise known as czars, as well as other sensitive government documents from several years. As FinCEN has stated previously, the unauthorized disclosure of SARS is a crime that can impact the national security of the United States, compromise law enforcement investigations, and threaten the safety and security of the institutions and individuals who file such reports. FinCEN has referred this matter to the U.S. Department of Justice and the Department of Treasury's Office of Inspector General. Um, so for anyone who is not familiar with SARS are, you should probably know what they are. They explained it a little bit in the article that just dropped literally 20 minutes ago. But uh, the convenient definition is that a czar, a suspicious activity report, is a tool provided under the U.S. Um, Bank Secrecy Act, or BSA, of 1970 for monitoring suspicious activities that would not ordinarily be flagged under other reports, such as the currency transaction report, and the czar became the standard form to report suspicious activity in 1996. Ooh. Uh, suspicious, suspicious activity reports can cover almost any activity that is out of the ordinary. See, this connects very, very well to uh, uh, Fat F story. An activity may be included in the suspicious activity report if the activity gives rise to a suspicion that the account holder is attempting to hide something or make an illegal transaction. Um, as Thomson Reuters Legal says, uh, failure to comply with any of these regulations can result in civil and criminal penalties including substantial fines, regulatory restrictions, loss of banking charter, and even imprisonment. They also note that the effectiveness of a czar report is connected to the extreme confiden confidentiality required for such reporting. At no time is the person under investigation told about the pending report. Likewise, any discussion with outside groups such as media companies is considered an unauthorized disclosure and is a federal criminal offense. When a bank or financial institution files a czar, they are required to take significant steps to ensure the information provided is reviewed at multiple stages by financial investigators, company management, and attorneys before finalizing the czar. Maintaining a high level of confidentiality is vital. Well, as we uh, have just found out today, um, that confidentiality is now gone, at least in part. And of course, the ICIJ... The International Consortium of Investigative Journalists is the same group that organized the publication of the Panama Papers, and um, as far as I know, their source has not been found. Uh, and so they are publishing undeterred, and by the time you are going to hear this episode, unless you're hearing it live, which is literally 24 minutes after the drop, but if you hear this later... Uh, the release will already be public, and a bunch of people will have read it, and you can follow that at FinCEN Files. And now I will just read a section from the article, because then we will be the first podcast to, to talk about this. <laughs> so according to the uh, article that was just published at ICIJ.org, um, which also links to the database where you can look at the documents that some of which are redacted, which is their usual policy. But um, they say that BuzzFeed News obtained the records and shared them with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. ICIJ organized a team of more than 400 journalists from 110 news organizations in 88 countries to investigate the world of banks and money laundering. 
In all, an ICIJ analysis found the documents identify more than $2 trillion in transactions between 1999 and 2017 that were flagged by financial institutions' internal compliance officers as possible money laundering and other criminal activity or other criminal activity, including uh, $514 billion at J.P. Morgan and thirteen or no, $1.3 trillion at Deutsche Bank. Suspicious, uh, they note at the very end, suspicious activity. Activity reports reflect the concerns of watchdogs within banks and are not necessarily evidence of criminal conduct or other wrongdoing. And so that's the key part there for me is that um, for me, like I'm sure (laughs) there's two parts to this. So a lot of these are's uh, the ones that they're highlighting. I don't know if they, you know, they, they received a lot of documents and I saw some of the commentary leading up to this, that the, uh, that the, they they took the discretion of like focusing on influential people not the average person so you're not going to i don't think you're going to be able to look through this and it, it you like you wouldn't show up in this um so they're focusing on like influential people like politicians and um the very wealthy and stuff like that it's still important to note that, that if if they could get the records on those, um, they could have gotten the records on you too. If you did anything that could have triggered a czar, um, which just FYI, those can be triggered just based on the amount of money you're spending or receiving, like on no other indication besides that. So, you know, as I read, they claim that there is a high degree of confidentiality about these records and these are generated most of the time without your knowledge whatsoever they unless they actually act on it then you may find out that one was generated but generated without your knowledge and can be very sensitive as a lot of people are about to find out and so that should bring into question look at the consequence of the financial surveillance look at where that data ends up going do you want the whole world to know <laughs> about your financial life even when literally it says you are not uh this is not necessarily evidence of criminal conduct or other wrongdoing this is still financial surveillance and most people have not committed a crime i'm sure a bunch of the people that are listed in the article have done something bad but the the point is that there is so much financial surveillance that you are getting lumped in with people like this not in this release necessarily but in terms of these reports and the other part of this is um, that the article details, you know, how banks behaved and how they kind of turned the other cheek when it came to ultra wealthy people who made them out of money because they were clients. And, you know, we talked about it with the Jeffrey Epstein instance with, uh, and also in my newsletter with Deutsche Bank. Was it Deutsche Bank? Yes, it was. U.S. U.S. Uh, version of Deutsche Bank, um, that, you know, they, <laughs> the government and Deutsche Bank knew about an investigation into him in 2007. They knew about it, and literally all their uh, AML person did was literally to look up the names of people that they believed he was transacting with to make sure that they were over the age of 18. That is that was their compliance strategy. <laughs> so what you find out with a release like this is that, you know, there are some people who have tons of czars on their on their, their business, and yet they are still allowed to continue using the financial system, moving millions, if not billions of dollars, and they are not affected because this is just how the financial system works. The average person does not get to (laughs) does not get that luxury like there may be some banks where if you even get one czar or you generate multiple czars and even if there's no evidence found of criminal misconduct you might you know lose your account for whatever reason there are people who lose their accounts who don't do anything wrong all the time so i feel like this also shows the double standard for people uh, when it comes to their relationship with the banking system, it basically is designed to serve the wealthy, and that's what is shown here. Black finger up the ass. Uh, suddenly win lottery scratch off. Finger up the ass. Sell drugs that hurt nobody. Finger up the ass. Did the little kids uh, inherit money out of nowhere? Finger up the ass. 
Mm-hmm. Believe it or not, have suit look too nice, finger up the ass. Yeah, so it says uh, the leaked documents known as the FinCEN files include more than 2,100 suspicious activity reports filed by banks and other financial firms with the U.S. Department of Justice or U.S. Department of Treasuries Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Uh, the agency known in shorthand as FinCEN is an intelligence unit at part of the global system to fight money laundering. So this is not, not just like banks reports and keeping them. This is records that banks provided to FinCEN. So FinCEN also knows this, and the banks that they mostly focus on are HSBC, Standard Chartered Bank, Deutsche Bank, and the Bank of New York Mellon. Ooh, that might be uh, relevant to uh, uh, crypto space um, in a way. Uh, yes, so go and look at them. And I'm sure we'll bring it back up again next week. Anyway, I think that does it for today. Got any final thoughts? Well, uh, my final thought would just be basically an update on what happened in the last week of Assange's extradition trial, which, holy crap, um, <laughs> more uh, freaky business with the British court system being not functional. Um, for example, the Probably the most significant part was uh, be just for the fact that Assange is not able to talk very much. He basically, like the only time where he, he doesn't talk to his lawyers, he, or he talks to them very little. They've started actually having sessions um, before court starts where he can meet with his lawyers for like 30 minutes because he hasn't, prior to this, he hasn't seen them for six months. And other than that, he does not speak during the trial, which, like, I can't imagine how frustrating that is to be sitting in a room for seven hours every day of the week um, and listening to people talk about you, misinterpret things you said, misinterpret things other people said about you, and just generally shitting on you without having an opportunity to say anything um, because, you know, meh. And... So one of the times where he did speak up was that one of the witnesses who was supposed to testify was Khalid El Masri, who is a German, I think he's German and Lebanese citizen, um, who uh, has made very credible allegations that were actually in a German court, um, I think a number of years ago, that he was basically... Um, accidentally kidnapped and tortured by the CIA and yes uh and he's you know understandably very upset about that and also understands what it <laughs> he can give some advice about the kind of system that Assange will fall into if he gets extradited to the United States and it was very strange because basically he was not able to, he, his statement was read into the record. It was actually, well, summarized. It was even worse. His statement was summarized into the record by the defense because he was supposed to testify over the video link to the court and, and that wasn't working as it hasn't been working often <laughs> over these past two weeks. And so instead of thinking, well, you know, this is our fault, we've decided that he should testify, maybe we should delay or call up another witness, you know, the technical problems are their fault. Instead, the prosecution started arguing that his testimony wasn't necessary, they didn't, they didn't need it, and they could just summarize his statement to the record. And um, Assange got very angry about that. He actually spoke up and said that, you know, well... He was quoted as saying he will not allow a torture victim to be censored in his own trial. Like he was very insistent on that because part of the problem, part of the reason the prosecution wasn't very interested in ha having his statement read into the record is because the U.S. government literally still does not acknowledge what they did to him. They just it just didn't happen for them, and so to hear that be read into the record is well on their side extremely contentious so yeah that was probably the highlight of the week is that a torture victim dis was almost able to testify and the u.s government and the british court system basically censored him 
which is so disgusting on so many levels. That sounds like a perfect symbol for 2020. Like it, he was so close to testifying that literally they delayed his testimony for at least half an hour to wait for his interpreter to come. And his interpreter came and she was standing in court. And then she got dismissed when they decided, oh, we'll just read his statement into the record. That is how close it got. 2020. Oh, I don't know. Got anything else? I will look for something. Well, meanwhile, I think a certain death uh, the other day has just guaranteed that the coming month or so is going to be even more massive of a shit show than it was already going to be. This is going to be fun to watch. All right, I have a final thought, which is sort of related to my prior final thought, but also separate um just because it's hilarious so craig murray is a former british diplomat and he's been one of the few people that has been let into um i believe he's in the public gallery of the extradition trial and so he's um basically just writing up and publishing notes of what he observes and the arguments that people are making and um unrelated to that i guess there was a picture of him that was taken in the last couple of days when he was around the court at some point and he i guess he was holding a carton of milk and uh, he tweeted afterwards in answer to the resulting questions of course it is full fat those who skim milk and sell opaque water to the public will roast in the foulest pit of hell <laughs> suck it purveyors of the nazi vegan agenda so like short story in that um i've been i've been drinking full fat milk since 2014 because basically um up until that point i've been drinking skin milk and that was just mostly because i think just skin milk is more popular in the u.s than, than it is in europe but i basically started drinking um full fat milk when i was on a trip in 2014 and then when i went back to the u.s after that i could not drink skim milk again after that because it tasted awful to me so i yes that was my transition that's the keto gods telling you Sk yes yeah, skim milk is everywhere but i feel like more americans drink skim milk than i don't know i just feel like that's the case i feel like there's a skew in the U.S. towards skim milk, and in the in Europe, it's more towards full fat milk. That's because Americans eat cancer food. Yes. Alrighty though, I yeah. think we'll call that a wrap for the day. We'll catch you later, punks, and let's see if you know we get censored. Long live RGB. <laughs>